So I just, uh, I want to start just by saying hi. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Donnie Bryant. He's a copywriter from Chicago. And uh, I have to say years ago, I've been writing the Copywriters Roundtable for a long time. And the, the name of the Copywriters Roundtable has always implied that it's a bunch of copywriters sitting around the table talking about things. Uh, and after a lot of long stretches, I find that I'm doing a lot of talking and not any, asking anybody else to, to talk. And I, I remember I put out a message saying that I'd love to get contributions. And I did get contributions from a lot of different copywriters. Uh, Donnie is one that sent in an article and then another article and another article uh, over those years. And I, I have always, to be perfectly honest, uh, you are in my, among my, I won't, I won't limit anybody else who's contributed because I love all the contributors, but you're one of my favorite contributors because I always find that those articles are the way that I would think about something too, or that I would wish I had thought about it. So, uh, yeah, so I love Donnie's stuff. So it's, it's uh, nice for us to get a chance to actually meet face to face because yeah. I, I don't think we ever have, but no, we never have. Um, so. first of all, I appreciate that. Secondly, I appreciate seriously have the, your willingness to share my my little articles. I believe last time I counted it was like twenty two or twenty three over the last. I think we. I think the first one was in like twenty eleven or twenty twelve. So I guess it's we've kind of known right. each other for like eight years. <laughs> right. But it's the first time we we've, we've spoken voice to voice. So, uh, but I appreciate that. And you you've been an enormous uh, blessing to me my my in my career actively and, and kind of passively, you know, you connect me with Clayton Makepeace. So, so the, the fact that I got to meet Clayton Makepeace in person is largely due to you dropping my name when he was looking for speakers at one of his events. Uh, I don't know if I can repay you uh, <laughs> for everything I, that you've done. I, I think this, uh, I mean, I, I think people, some of the people who have WAI thinks and everything they know, they know that it's just like a big uh, community that I think is part of what's really great I think about being part of the copywriting community is that everybody gets to meet everybody and I tend to think the copywriters seem like nicer people <laughs> <laughs> that's been that's been my experience as well right um, so we were gonna talk about um, we were gonna talk about uh, different topics I, I honestly I I, uh, I looked through a lot of stuff that you sent me and some of your stuff on your website and everything. I think there's a lot that we could cover there. But um, I guess one of the things that's most recent that you sent me was the thing about the coronavirus situation and, and people are trying to figure out how to navigate that. You know, we say the new normal, but it almost doesn't feel new anymore because it's three months old and it feels like it's going to stick around one way or the other. Um, so yeah, my wife said she can't imagine ever feeling the same that she did before. I think, well, I think that that in itself is, is interesting because um, on, on the one hand, I get that sense too. But uh, on the other, the, the resilience of it just humanity just seems incredible. So like, like I look at the people keep referring back to the Spanish flu and, uh, how that must have felt like a real, the game changer. That's the bridge that we can never go back across. Uh, right. But, um, you know, when people are saying we're never going to shake hands again and we're never going to do business the same way again, I just don't see it. I just, yeah, I, agree I, think, we, I think we will. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, in particular, my wife was saying like for when we go shopping, you know, we wipe everything down or wash it in, in uh, hot soapy water. And she's right. thinking he may do this forever because who knows when the next one will pop up, you know, COVID-20, right. <laughs> you know, COVID -20. Knows? so, you know, there, there's, you, but you're exactly right. You know, we tend to have emotions get hot, they get hot in, in the middle of something that we're unsure about. And then once things feel more steady, then you get back to normal. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Right. But the, the current state, a lot of people I know, not everybody, is is in kind of in that mind space this is this is the new normal this is how life will be and uh anyway this that's kind of the, the point of the article was how we've gotten to this place <laughs> of being convinced where i mean the mortality rate isn't what the spanish flu's mortality rate was by any stretch not the bubonic plague right perry marshall shared 
did you see this Perry Marshall video? It was, it was, he called it, what was it? Mm. Pandemic Raw Door or something like that, <laughs> where mm. everybody's dying. You had to cut, take people off in, in the dead cart. And we right. don't have that, you know. So, yeah. you know, but but we've, we've come to the point where everybody in the world or whatever, it seems like, is has changed their behavior, the hate changed their way of perceiving things. And how do we get to that place? And how can copywriters and marketers kind of take inspiration from that or take right. cues from that? Well, I think it, I think it, uh, it is uh, fascinating to, to watch it in a sense. I mean, it, to, to be a writer, not even just a copywriter, but to be a writer in general, to be somebody who's an observer and you, you can't help but feel a certain aspect of uh, removal from a situation too, where you're almost like an anthropologist studying sure. a big mass experiment. Um, and it can, it seems like it can be, um, I don't know, you can, you can look at it and you can think, it, it is amazing how fast the mindset of a, of a crowd, uh, a marketing crowd, if you want, like an audience, can shift one way or the other. So what we're trying to, part of the reason we're trying to observe is because we're trying to figure out where people are when we're writing to them. So um, that's, I think, the question that we've been asking a lot. You know, you and I both write for financial stuff and and uh, the markets haven't reacted in, in a way anybody could have predicted. Right. Uh, you know, and just when you think that they're going to go up, they go down. And just when you think that the, everything's over, they start going up again. It's really confusing. Yeah. Um, and the, and the audience, I think we like we look at them and they say, "Where are they right now? Are they? And what? Where do they expect to be a month from now, a year from now? Are they right. afraid that this is never going to change? Or are they uh, really hungry for something hopeful? Um, or are they in that position where they're afraid?" And if you speak in any other terms than being afraid, they're going to not trust you because they won't think you're credible because you don't right. get the risks. Right. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so it's an interesting thing. All of those things are true in some segments, right? Depending yeah. on who you're speaking to, each of those tones is probably appropriate and has been maybe shifting, but mm -hmm. at any given time, you'll find that all three of those uh, voices or vo tones of voice would be right on the money for a particular segment. So yeah, we gotta, you gotta be in tune to be aware of those things, but also to know your particular list, your particular audience, what are they feeling right now? Or what, what, were, they, right. what were they anticipating feeling? And I found, you probably found the same thing is true. I think everybody wants hope, you know? So even if you yeah. begin with fear, if you get to hope, you're bringing people where they wanna be because everybody so. wants, they, they want, and, and when you step into a place of leadership, I know you're scared, but this is how we navigate this. This is, this is what you need to know. And you say it with confidence, people are really resonating. And sales, we've been seeing record sales since March. Ridiculous, because of that leadership role that we're stepping into. Rather than, we don't know what's going on, we've made decisive, uh, taking decisive stances, said I can lead you through this, financially, right. of course. And, and people have, it's been resonating really well and right. it hasn't stopped since. Yeah. I think that that's, uh, I think that's a wise observation because the people, uh, no matter what you're selling, you are selling hope. Yeah. I mean, even if it's not financial stuff, you're selling health stuff or whatever, um, selling travel, selling a, a thing that I don't have, this thing will, will make your life better than it is right now. Right. I, everything is, everything is about, um, improving the position that you're in now and, right. and it connects with people because it improves it in the direction that they're hoping to improve right right so exactly right i, I put it in three categories and just because it's uh alliteration right body oh, right, right body bank and boot so you want you I, want your body and your health I like that. to get better I that. right you want your money to get better either making more saving more and then you want your boo which is how young people talk about their Love the right. ones, right? <laughs> right. Uh, you want your relationships to get better. If I'm on the verge of divorce, how do I fix that? And if you can help right. me fix it, I will love you forever. Yeah, so that's what you gotta like, get. This is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it's really Donnie's. <laughs> this is like Donnie's like uh, triangle. 
<laughs> the three. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that works. I think that works. I, I uh, uh, Somebody that we both know, uh, Mark Ford, not, I always feel, I have to feel like I have to say he's not related to me, but uh, <laughs> but I'd be lucky if he was. He's a smart guy. Great. Uh, anyway, uh, um, Mark uh, has always said that he thinks that all, that even the motivation for the financial products that um, it's it's about keeping score and it's about keeping score in a way that you earn respect and often that respect is related to the relationships including your boo <laughs> so uh, so you can you know they they kind of funnel together and and I think you ask most people who are uh, they want their their health. They're either young and they want to look good because they want to have good relationships or they're uh, older and they want to stay healthy so that they can be around for the relationships with people. Right. And that's an interesting shift too. Cause I remember yeah. being in my twenties and not worrying about the end. Right. <laughs> right. And being getting, now I'm, I'm not quite 40 yet, but I'm already beginning to think, how do I extend <laughs> the right. end part? Mostly because my kids and, and I'm, you know, you know how it is with your kids. You're like, I got to stick around. Yeah. I got to stick around. Exactly. I got to be healthy. I don't want to be falling apart and then they have to take care of me in, in my 50s or 60s. So it's interesting. Again, where, wherever your audience is, if they're 20 year olds, you have to talk to them different than 50 year olds. Right. right. Your kids are, young, are much younger. Yeah, I have twins that, that are 17. And I have oh. big girls. And I have a 13 year old son who wears bigger clothes than me. Actually, he grew out of some clothes that I now wear. Uh, <laughs> He's, he's, so, so your kids, yeah, they're about the same age as ours. Ours is sixteen and thirteen. Yeah, and I got a, I got a nine-year-old as well. He'll be ten next month. Well, you got a good family there. It's good, good. Or we, it, um, it's almost like we planned it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the kids, I, I, uh, I mean, people are going to wonder why we're talking about this from a marketing perspective, but I really do think um, that, say, you're talking to prospective customers who have kids. Uh, their point of view on the world is a different point of view. Totally and different. It is. It is shaped by that. As soon as you have kids, it really does. It does uh, have a way of focusing your your uh, agenda. Yeah, the priorities <laughs> are totally rearranged. Right. In a um, way, I suppose. Yeah. So I, I mean, as you were saying that about being younger and being healthy, I, I was thinking that we were talking before we turned on the uh, recording that. Um, about people wearing masks and things like that. And I walk around on the street and I, I, I see people hanging out in the, in the bars and they're always in exactly the same age range sitting there without the masks on, pressed up against each other, you know, real close. And, uh, and I, I look at it and it's somewhere in the back of my mind because that's not safe, that's not safe. <laughs> but right. I don't know, I don't know. So I should bring us back to the to the coronavirus uh, mindset. So, so here you are, you're a copywriter, you're uh, working with the financial stuff, uh, financial newsletters, I'm assuming same as, as awesome. me. Yeah. Um, and uh, what, what are you seeing now? What do you, what are you thinking now? You, uh, I've had the same experience that things seem to be working very well right now. I think that's partly because people have money on their mind. I think it's partly because the markets are going up and partly because people are at home. So we've got a, a literally a captive audience. Best, best in any time I've, I've ever seen. Yeah. So, so what are you, uh, what are you thinking right now? Like, what are you saying or what do you, what would you tell people? Yeah. Kind of what I mentioned before, <clears throat> you need to position yourself as a leader in whatever space you're in and financial is true. Um, you say, this is how, the market is going to, the market's been crazy. Volatility is as high as you've seen it. We actually had worse volatility earlier, earlier this year than any, any time on record. Um, but now, even now it's still at an elevated level, but some people are a little crazy and you see the market today. What is happening? We had a good week last week. Right. Uh, but if you can say, I know what's, what's going to happen, if whatever your gimmick is, I say gimmick in a loving way, but based on historical patterns, first based on technical analysis, based on whatever, we can show that the market is likely to do this and then it's going to do this and I can help you get, make the money on the way here or if it's going down, I can prevent you from losing everything. But you got to take a, take a decisive stance. This, I had a, <laughs> this is a couple of years ago, uh, but the guy, the guru I was writing for, he said, the market could do one of two things. It could go up or it could go down. <laughs> 
I could have figured that out on my own. I didn't, I don't, I'm not going to pay you to tell me one of two things. I want to know one thing, the single best thing I can do right now uh, to get through this thing I'm uncertain about. So that's the thing about volatility, it's uncertainty. Help, help me become certain of something in my life, anything, especially when right now, right. I'm uncertain about everything. Are the cops going to come pull me over? And they do, right? <laughs> are, are, is the market going to take away everything? My pool guy told me he lost $2 million this year. And he doesn't know when he's going to be able to retire. Well, if he didn't sell everything, he's probably back to fine, right? I don't know <laughs> what he did. But so you're uncertain. Help me get certain about something in my life. Is my wife going to leave me for the mailman, right? <laughs> Help me get certain about something. And in financial, that's, that's what we're doing. We're saying, I'm, this is what's going to happen based on something. You have a specific reason to know. Because everybody, you know, CNBC isn't going to tell you anything good. <laughs> right. We want to keep you glued to the screen. <clears throat> so stepping into a place of leadership and certainty for an uncertain audience, it's, it's going to get them attached to you, help them, you know, oh, certainty. That's what I want. So, you know, confidence. That's what I need. Right. You know, a good result where I don't know where else I'm going to get it. That's, and they want to attach themselves to you. As long as you can be credible while you're doing it. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think so. So you were saying before, hope is one thing that you're selling to somebody. Uh, that hope of, uh, hope of some improvement of, from their current situation to something else. Yeah. I think that that uh, other observation, the idea that, uh, of selling certainty is that's another thing that's kind of universally applicable because yeah. uh, the source of most people's um, unhappiness, anxiety, lie awake, stare at the ceiling at night is a lack of certainty, which is why sometimes it feels better to somebody uh, that they know even a bad outcome if they're sure that, that, that it's done, because at least, at least they it's know done what it is. <laughs> and we can move on to something else. It's much harder to know, to not know what's going to happen. Yep. Um, and and yeah, look, so, uh, to have a sense of control, we and it, it, it's very common right now, people feel like they've lost control over some aspects of their lives. It's probably always true, right? But if, if you can re, help me regain a sense of control, I feel like I, I'm back in control of some part of my life. People will love you for that as well. So the certainty and control and hope. If I have control, right. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an adult. <laughs> I, don't, I wanna be able to control something in my life. And, and, I, and that's another, it, it applies universally, of course. Uh, but I, I found like right now, because there's that feeling in the air of, I don't, I don't know how, what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how to get where I wanna go. And so if you can help people regain, here's how we get this thing. I mean, you're going to be in control of your money. You're going to be in control of your health once again, because you don't know about, that's why immunity is working so well in health, because I can, I can, I can, I can protect myself. I don't know what's going on out there, but I can, right. I can defend myself uh, and I can, I can control my intake of vitamin C or whatever. Uh, and now you're in control of something and that, that settles you down as well. Right. See, I think I think that's a third. That's another third. That's another important uh, thing is the idea of control. If people want to have, um, they want to have some kind of. Uh, so they look for leadership, but they look for the leadership because they eventually want to be able to control their own situation. They want to have right. uh, a certain independence, a certain um, ability to just stand on their own two feet. Yeah. Uh, so they they're it, looking for somebody both, to right? emulate or. Sorry, I said maybe it's both. You know, we want to be rugged individualists in a way, but at the mm -hmm. same time, we, we crave somebody to to blaze the path for us. So I'm right. autonomously following the leader. I'm autonomous though, but I'm going right. the same direction he's lead or she. Right. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I I think I think that's true. Uh, I think um, I mean I think most people are just by just by pure statistical. Uh, the nature of statistics would be that most people are uh, not leaders. Most I people agree. want, most people will follow. Yes. Um, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, so they, but they crave leadership, but they also crave a certain amount of uh, self-respect. Oh, absolutely. And, and part of your self-respect comes from your, your confidence in your own ability to do something. Yeah. So. hundred percent true.
I, I mean, I 100% agree. agree. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's true, but I agree. Right. And it's part of, I think it's part of that loop that feeds back that that's why, uh, <clears throat> that's what people are hopeful for. That's what they want, why they want to change from where they are what, right. to something else because they, Absolutely. they want something to believe about themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the so, things, and I, just to kind of mention why the coronavirus, because it was a big universally acknowledged reality, I, I wanted to hone in on because so many marketers, not so much in financial, actually definitely not in financial, uh, but in so many of the small business owners that I know, now, and you, you probably have the same conversation, they don't want to talk about fear. They don't want to scare people. They don't want to feel like they're uh, taking advantage of people's right. emotional state. But the, my point that I, and I tell them all the time, there are some things that you legitimately should be scared of. And so it's, it's, the best way in and fear is probably the thing that gets our attention more than anything. If I'm terrified about something, my senses are all focused on the source of terror and that that's a way in. So with coronavirus, you can only talk about it directly for so long. And then uh, the ads were getting banned, right. And the emails were not getting delivered. And then people started on oh, another coronavirus message, but you could, you, you still had to get in, through that angle, you're feeling scared. Well, I don't say you have to, but it was effective for us to mm -hmm. get in that way. Fear is just is an effective motivator that people need to get comfortable with using when it's appropriate. And you can almost always find it in a way to make it appropriate. Uh, and, and I just want I wanted to encourage my readers when I shared that, uh, don't shy away from fear. It's legitimate. Again, if, my, if I'm worried about divorce, and I should be, if I'm, if my, if I'm there, it's not a good thing. So I'm scared my wife's going to leave me. Now I'm paying attention to something that will help me from that. If I'm scared, I'm going to have a heart attack at, at 40. <laughs> that'd be a bad thing. I'm, that's something that I should be scared of if, if I'm, my cholesterol is out of control, my blood pressure is yeah. out of control. I have whatever uh, history of heart disease. So those are legitimate fears. You write copy and say everything's happy and there's unicorns in the front yard. It's, it's not, I mean, sure. people will like that, you know, but they won't necessarily buy from you. They won't, and right. plus they may not believe you. Like that's not my experience. My experience is the doctor keeps changing my, upping my medicine because I can't get this thing fixed. And so they're scared it's, and it's a legitimate fear. And if you write copy speaking to that, uh, then you're just speaking to a, as a powerful motivator and it is where people are and there's nothing wrong with getting there, using fear to get their attention, to get them to take the action right. that they need to take for their own improvement. Right. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to, like, I, I, I try to, I try to avoid uh, talking about politics one way or the other in the yeah. CR, because I think, you know, we've, we're all on the same page as far as copy goes. I don't want to picking politics, but I do think it is okay. interesting to watch uh, somebody who is on screen all the time <clears throat> has to make choices about what they say and they get an immediate feedback from what they say yeah. as to whether or not it worked. Yeah. And you take somebody like the current president who uh, at the beginning of this, uh, the beginning of this uh, crisis was trying to make positive statements. It's going to go away. It's going to go, you know, it's going to be fine. It's going to, et cetera. Um, but then the numbers didn't back that up and people started to get, uh, they started to get frightened. So, um, as a PR move, it did not, it didn't pan out right. the way that he had hoped, whether or not you, one supports him or doesn't support him. It's, it's hard to deny that as a, as a marketer looking at that, that it was probably not the right strategy. Um, and then you look at, uh, Bill, what Bill Clinton famously said. Uh, you know, I feel your pain, which it took him a while to come around to that uh, marketing strategy himself. And one of his his advisors said, look, you got to focus on the economy because we were in an economic downturn. And if you try to talk around that, nobody will hear you. Uh, and that did that did work out for him. Yeah, um, I think it's a similar I think it is a similar thing that yeah. uh, you're saying you've got to acknowledge the fears. Uh, in order for people to feel heard and feel like you're not, uh, 
you know, clueless about what's going on. So exactly. To be fair, there's no way Mr. Trump could have looked good on this because nobody knew. <laughs> it's his crisis. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like he, maybe he could have handled it better, but you don't want to spread fear early because it's not good for the not good for anybody to be in. Well, that's, a, that's a risk at the position. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, but then, so he didn't want to do that, and understandably so. Uh, but, but it's, it became a pandemic that we didn't really anticipate. What well, happened? He wanted. I mean, I don't. You know. So, well, no matter how you felt about him, right. and maybe or the way he handled it, there was no really great way to handle it, and it was a fast-moving situation. So we didn't have time to like. It's the economy, stupid. Yeah. Well, we've seen this develop. This mm-hmm. happened very fast, and and we haven't seen anything like it. So. To be fair, you know, no matter how you feel about Mr. Trump, sure. <laughs> he, it was sure, really yeah. hard on him. <laughs> sure, I don't, and again, I don't want to. I like, I don't. I'm, I, I'm not looking for uh, ways to divide people in one way or the other because sometimes they're going to have an, a feeling about one or the other side and not yeah. be able to hear the argument. But I do. The point I think to make is like, is that that it, it can hurt your credibility if you if you start talking to somebody in a way that just doesn't jive with the way that they're feeling Absolutely. at the moment. So well, somebody, this is, you. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, this is like the Schwartz idea where they're problem aware. And if yeah. you don't talk about the problem, but, but at the same time, you don't wanna go on and on about it. Right. And you know, 10 pages of coronavirus copy. And now I think if you talk about the coronavirus a lot, people will be like, oh my God. Yeah. So exactly. tired of talking about it. You yeah. Know? I'm trying to avoid using any of those words at this point. Yeah. You know, if you do, it's it's buried way deep and you just use it uh, kind of parenthetically. Mm. Uh, or, you know, in the ret- retrospect, you know, when the pandemic hit, this happened, and, but now this is where we are. Um, I found with fear also, well, if you try to lead with big promises, and now look, you've written a great book, great leads is fantastic, right? There's a place for that. Uh, but in sometimes leading with, positivity sounds like a sales pitch right right and if you lead with fear people are a little bit less they feel a little bit less like you're coming at them with a salesman pitch you're talking about what's happening in the world it's a little bit scary and so they're not on the defensive immediately they say hey here's how to make 10 million dollars that's a salesman here's Mm -hmm. how to here's how to avoid losing 10 million dollars it's a little bit different like oh i could lose 10 million dollars that's something i don't want to do uh, that's a bad example, but but the the idea I found fear circumvents a little bit of that sales resistance in the beginning. You're right; you have yeah. to pivot away from fear. Um, just you use fear to get in the door, right? Well, that, you know that's uh, that's a uh, that's another uh, Gene Schwartz thing that I always feel like it's harder to explain. But the idea where he talks about levels of sophistication, yeah, where. Um, I think people are out there, they, they may not be, they not, may not be as knowledgeable about solutions and things that are being offered. They might not even be aware of exactly what problems to worry about because it seems like there's so many piling up right these days. Um, but they are at the sophistication level. The amount of times that they've been approached by somebody who wants to sell something is going, just going up and up and up. All right. So they're more the resistance, uh, the sophistication is high. Therefore, the resistance is high. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Now, I, I, I don't know. Do you like? Uh, um, I, I have a preference for when I'm writing a promotion. I, I think that the, the macro, fear-based promotions are harder to write, to make them work. But I like doing them much better because the ideas just seem richer to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. I think that's usually the case for me as well. It's, yeah, yeah there's, there's much more to play with. <laughs> and yeah. I think like, you know, we, we love to do research. <clears throat> and so the, it allows you to go and find weird stories, crazy statistics. And, the, and, and on a macro level, it, it gives you, you have a greater pool of resources to find the big idea or, or to find, you know, the startling, uh, hook that's that's really gonna let you sink, you know, sink into the mind of the reader. So say you're, uh, I mean, you're a pretty young guy. So say you're writing to to uh, copywriters getting started out um, right now. 
in this climate, would do you feel like they should do anything different? Um, any yeah. way to specialize or anything? Well, specialize, I tell people all the time, I actually, I don't mentor in a formal way because I, I don't really have the time <laughs> or mm. the, uh, the disposition for that. But uh, I, I try to advise beginning copywriters all, as often as I can. And one of the things I tell them all the time is to specialize as soon as you can. And as long as you're not specializing on something that there's no market in or where there's no market. But specialization is important for, you know, your own development. You can become really good. And for your building your reputation, it's much easier to build a reputation in a smaller pond than the entire world's oceans. And, and then you can charge, you can charge more, right. <laughs> which is my favorite reason. Uh, and I, I wish I had, I avoided financial for a long time. I was scared of it. And I, I didn't, really didn't understand the stock market and I didn't understand a lot of things. Um, so I didn't want to do it. Even when people who were successful told me this is a great place to be if you want to earn the kind of money you want to make. And I'd be like, eh, I don't want to go to jail for saying something. I didn't realize there were compliance departments. I don't want to go to jail for saying something I shouldn't say. And I don't, I don't know why stocks go up and what, what, is, what is a put option. I don't know these things. Uh, but I, I got clients out of, not intentionally, and it kept happening. So I, I just, it felt like destiny and I went with it. But I wish I had decided sooner to do it. And I would probably be a little bit further ahead, or f further down the road than I am now. now. Not that I'm unhappy with where I am, but I probably, I probably could have accelerated things. Specialization is important. Uh, and we kind of, I, I have been teasing you about this. I haven't told you. But I, I believe, because we define copywriting as salesmanship in print, and it is. In 2020 and beyond, though, I think we have to think about it in a little bit different way. Because I don't think we know what salesmanship is <laughs> anymore. Young people, right. they have weird ideas. They haven't gone door-to-door -door selling. None of them have. Almost none of them. Right. A lot of them haven't done face-to-face -face in stores or anything like that, telesales. So I... I I'm beginning to describe it as showmanship in print. Now, if you think about it, a good salesman mm -hmm. is a good showman. Right. But, but if you, you, know, you think of a salesman as that used car salesman guy who just, he lies and he, you know, he, he doesn't really care about people. That's not what you want to do. We're in a Netflix driven society. Everybody, <laughs> everybody's all in for entertainment. I wrote, yeah. I wrote an email once. I don't know if I sent this to you. I probably didn't because there wasn't really a lot of juice in this email, but the subject line was homeless folk need Netflix too. <laughs> and it was a true story about a relative of mine who had no place to live, but a premium Netflix account. How to use it. Or he had she. a phone. <laughs> he was watching on his phone. Uh, him and his, his, his family. It's, but it, the point was to show the priority. People will pay for entertainment before they pay for some of their real necessities. Entertainment's a necessity. Uh, I think more and more we're seeing these commercials like uh, Squatty Potty and, and uh, Dollar Shave Club, the Harmon Brothers kind of style, Billie Jean is marketing style, entertaining ads. And those are like extreme examples. Most people are not going to make Squatty Potty <laughs> right. uh, or Tush. Have you seen the Tush? It's like, it's a butthole. The whole ad is a butthole talking. <laughs> No, <laughs> it's terribly disgusting, but you can't stop watching. Uh, but people, you had to show <laughs> more that people had, we had to ex understand that people want to be entertained. And this is where Arthur Johnson comes in at, at Titans of Direct Response. And I wasn't there. I, I saw the videos after the fact, uh, but he said, you had to take people to the circus. When he's writing copy, he wants to take people to the circus. Do you remember that? Uh, I wasn't there either. Yeah, I was, a lot of my colleagues were there, but I wasn't there. Yeah, right. I, I felt as if I robbed myself by not being there, but I just didn't have the funds yeah. to do it. Uh, but Arthur Johnson also, in an interview with Clayton Makepeace years ago, back way back, uh, and he said that you had to you had to have proof, but you also had to get people's attention. And he said if I had to choose between the two, I would go for attention every time. Hmm. And so I think we as copywriters need to understand. And most established copywriters kind of understand this already. You have a great story to pull people right. in. We had to 
sales, when you think about a good salesman, they tell stories, but I think young people may not realize because <laughs> they haven't seen a great salesman in person. Uh, they, just, they just think it's rattling off the facts, uh, uh, the features, or even if you just say the benefits, the benefits are okay. But what people really want is a, a gripping story, a startling you know, reality, yeah. a hidden truth that pulls them in. And so I think showmanship in print involves storytelling, involves demonstration. You have to have this before and after kind of thing, or you, know, you, you demonstrate what you're trying to sell. Not just, you, we say, you, the more you tell, the more you sell. But showing is better than telling, right? Yeah. So a showman is going to sh help them to help the reader to visualize a reality, visualize the problem. I mean, they probably already have it, but you're going to dimensionalize the problem or like Schwartz said, right? Make bigger rats. <laughs> We're not, don't worry as much about the, the mousetrap, make a bigger mouse. And so I think to these days, how copywriters kind of need to uh, understand the importance of adding that those emotional elements right up front, stories, uh, demonstration, and something, a letter, a, a, an element of entertainment. That doesn't necessarily mean fun, right. but it's a, it's a story that you, you want to read, or it's a, a laying out of facts that's fascinating and not just selling. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying totally. to advise people to do. I think that's good advice. A, a certain level of engagement. Yes. I mean, uh, I, at, at the kids' school, um, my friend and I help run the debate team. And um, I, he just, uh, was a friend was doing it and he asked me to do it just to help out. And I, I was nervous because I, I had no idea how to do all that stuff. But I, I did get interested in it because what I started to see was that the, the thing that they had to do in the debate was the same thing that we're trying to do promotionally, which is l lay out a persuasive point in a way that's irresistible. Right. Um, and, and that's done so tightly that when it's done, the person feels like they're convinced, but they, they can't really put their finger on how you did it so well. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that that idea of engaging people with something beyond the facts. So like one of the things that we tell the kids is that, that um, you know, you can't just get up and read off a list of 10 facts because that's not, that might be, it might really support your point but it's not engaging because nobody likes to get smacked around by a list of 10 facts. Right. Um, but if you can, if you can wrap that in something fascinating, you know, it's like, it's like the difference between seeing a news report and uh, about somebody's life and seeing a really moving documentary, a really, or, or movie, a biopic. Right. Then you really feel it. Um, and yeah, yeah it's I, right now. I think more and more now, uh, you're right, that you, you have to be, that, it's tougher to be a copywriter now. You can't, <laughs> it is. you can't just do the, you can't just do that. Um, you can't just hit the, a Google search. And I've actually changed the way that I, uh, I was just talking about this with somebody, changed the way that I approach writing. Um, and for a long time, people would say, oh yeah, the, the thing that you do is you do a lot of research. And I do do a lot of research. Every good copywriter I know does a lot of research. But um, I definitely have gotten to a point, had gotten to a point where I was doing way too much research and counting on that to be my, to be, you know, the substance of what I put out there. Right. I now, I used to wait until I felt that point of like I was loaded up on research and then I would just start. Uh, but now I... I uh, I jump in and start writing while I'm still feeling very uncomfortable, like where I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. Uh, and I just fill in blanks because I think I need the velocity of of just getting out there and writing because that's when you start thinking the stories and the weird connections that you have no idea when they're coming. Yeah, it's so, so true. Yeah. One of my things that I say is momentum is a writer's best friend. You're so right. Yeah. Once you get writing, then your brain shakes loose. And the ideas can connect, but if you if you're waiting, I'm the same way. I love to pile up pages and pages of notes, right. and then uh, what's the what's the lead going to be? Oh shoot, I, I don't know. <laughs> Figure it's out it's in there one. somewhere. I've got thirty good leads, you know. So right. If you start writing though, then 
you'll figure it out. Yeah. It, it all begins to come together when you're in motion, but when you're, before you start, it's all, you're all, you're definitely in that place of discomfort. What, what should I do? Yeah. And yeah. it slows things down. All right. Well, Donnie, I think that we should, uh, we should wrap it up there. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Um, Great. thank you so much for, for being on the call for meeting after all these years and everything. And I actually have, I think two articles that I mean to put in the CR from you that I'm going to put in. So, um, nice. uh, so keep them coming. <laughs> and, I, uh, I'll do this. <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, it's, it's fun to read it, you know, <clears throat> but I get a lot of great feedback. Also people, people reach out to me as clients too. So I probably owe you money. <laughs> no. no, but, uh, but hopefully uh, people will go and, and look you up uh, online and I'll put a link uh, below the video on uh, YouTube right. and I'll, I'll send it to you too and you can do it whatever you want. And right. uh, hopefully we'll get to see each other in person in, in uh, Delray Beach or something for AWAI, you know, or yeah. something like that in the future. Yeah, I, I always, I'm a homebody, but I do need to get out and uh, mingle with, with our copywriting community. So uh, yes, let's, let's hope we can make that happen.